way we can have the distribution subscribe. I appreciate all the smoke and I'm certainly thankful for the opportunity to be back in God's house. And uh, I've just been uh, uh, had a hard week. Uh, some of y'all I know you've had a hard week. I ain't gonna talk about it fast. We still got an adversary, the devil. Mm -hmm. He's still fighting us. Try to do for the Lord, the more the devil will fight you. I'll tell you that. And uh, you know, the devil, he'd, uh, I ain't gonna brag on him this morning, but he'd like to shut me down. He'd like to shut this church down. He'd like to shut down, Brother Lonnie, what you talked about this morning in that good Sunday school lesson about uh, what the Apostle Paul was preaching. Now, I was thinking that she was teaching. Uh, I was listening a while back to. Uh, Billy Graham's, uh, the last interview they did with Billy Graham, and I, I know a lot of you probably saw that, uh, but the last interview they did uh, with Billy Graham, he was just down to a whisper. Uh, but he said, this is, uh, this is what I've learned. They asked him a question, and he said, this is what I've learned in all my years of ministry, what it comes down to. He said it comes down to the cross, and the blood. He summed it up right there. It comes down to the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that is shed for the atonement of sin. And uh, boy, I thought that was good. And that's what the Apostle Paul was preaching. Uh, uh, can I say something to you? Baptism is an ordinance given to the New Testament church. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the Lord's Supper. That's the only two ordinances God gave to the local New Testament church. Uh, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But I want to say something. Baptism don't save you. The Lord's Supper don't save you. The thief on the cross that hung beside Jesus, he was never baptized. He never had the Lord's Supper. Uh, but Jesus said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that was because that he believed on Jesus. He believed in his heart. And that's what the Apostle Paul was preaching. I was uh, salvation through Jesus Christ. And I appreciate that this morning. Uh, Carolina, where you at? I know you ain't asleep. Get up here so you can say your memory verse. <laughs>
going back to 1 Samuel chapter number 3. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. And boy, what a blessing that it has been to me this week to just studying uh, this scripture. I never, you know, the Lord never ceases to amaze me how that He works and uh, what He will show us out of His Word. Uh, it's, uh, it's, and, and I just I couldn't wait to get here this morning to share with y'all what God has shared with me. That's the, what a messenger is supposed to do, uh, to share with uh, the people what God has uh, shared through him. And that's what we've been talking about, kind of the theme uh, so far through 1 Samuel is God uh, preparing a messenger. Uh, to uh, deliver the word unto the folks. And here in uh, 1 Samuel, chapter number 3, uh, verse number 1, I'm going to go ahead and read these 21 verses to us, and uh, then we'll go back and talk about it. 1 Samuel, chapter number 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. If I had a title for this sermon today, it would simply be, How Precious Is the Word of God? How precious is the Word of God? Verse number 2, And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And there the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Levi, and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not. Lie down again, and he went lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Levi, and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the giant. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down. And it shall be, if he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. And Samuel, Samuel, then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant hear it. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged, with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay into the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that I have said, that, that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every whit, and he had nothing from him. And, and, and he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. And he and, and, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. And the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh 
by the word of the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you today for the precious word, for the reading of your word. God, I pray that you'd help us today, Lord, as we break the bread of life onto the table of the hearts of your people. God, I pray, Lord, for unction today, Lord. And God, I pray that you'd back up the opposing powers of hell and the devil from off this church and from off this service and from off these people. And God, help us today now, Lord. And what you do for us, we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. <laughs> How precious is the Word of God. Our subject today, I believe in this passage of Scripture, is the Word of God. Our purpose in this chapter is to see God's Word come alive through the messenger. The messenger of God brings the Word of God. God, through that messenger, brings that Word alive. I, Brother Lonnie has uh, you got the Sunday school lesson. What happened is, uh, when you take the bread of life and you start breaking it, God multiplies it, just like he did the bread when he fed the 5,000. When you take the gospel, when you take the word of God and uh, the messenger, the word of God comes alive through that messenger. I'll have you know today that there's no power in me uh, as a person, as a human being, uh, but God, for some reason, called me to preach His Word. And He takes His Word. And uh, He is faithful to bring that Word alive through the messenger, whatever, whoever the messenger may be. The Word of God can be rewarding and comforting as it was with Hannah. In the last two Sundays, we, uh, three weeks ago, we went into 1 Samuel and we talked about the prayer of Hannah. And uh, how God used her, how he used that young lady, and uh, how that God answered her prayers. Uh, and last week, the reward and comfort that God gave unto her uh, for the prayer that she prayed and how God answered it. And uh, the Word of God can be rewarding and comforting, as it was with Hannah. But I thought about this. It can also be for judgment and reproof as it is for Eli. We'll, we'll notice this morning that God had a message and he had a word for Eli. And uh, it was uh, for judgment and for reproof. And uh, sometimes, word of God, uh, it comes to me uh, for judgment. It comes to me for reproof. And thank God we can uh, have that and we can change our ways if need be. But what does the scripture say about the word of God? I thought about this. The Word of God. We, we say that term a lot, the Word of God. But what does the Scripture have to say uh, about uh, the Word of God? The first mention of the phrase, the phrase, the Word of the Lord, <coughs> you'll notice it in Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 1. Uh, the first mention of the phrase, the Word of the Lord. And I want to say something to you this morning about the law of first mention in the Bible. Uh, the, the law of first mention in your Bible is whenever something is first mentioned, it seems to carry that theme throughout the Scripture. Uh, and uh, here in Genesis 15, 1, and, and after these things, the word of the Lord, uh, the, the things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram, saying, Fear not, Abram, uh, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And so we'll notice the word of the Lord. Uh, it seems to carry that theme uh, throughout the Bible, especially through Abram's life. Uh, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And, and thank God this morning uh, through the word of the Lord that he is still, praise God today, our shield and our exceeding great reward. Hallelujah, Jesus, he's a shield. And he's a buckler to his uh, people today. And uh, he will help us through the hard times of our life. Amen. But he, praise God, is an exceeding great reward. I'm glad one of these days uh, that we're going to a land and we're going to see a city that's been built without hands. Praise God. We're going to a land 
that is fairer than day. Yeah. And we're going to receive that exceeding great reward. And that is to be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, throughout the ceaseless ages. Praise God. Boy, I'm glad for the word of the Lord today. And what it meant. Uh, can you imagine? Old Abram. God changed his name to Abraham. And there he went through his wife. We, we've studied Abraham. We know Abraham. And yet his life is a testimony to that. <coughs> the Lord being his shield and his exceeding great reward. I'll encourage your heart this morning. And I'll encourage my heart in the word of the Lord that he will be our shield and our exceeding great reward. Three times in chapter number 3 of 1 Samuel, uh, we come across the phrase, the word of the Lord, and six times throughout the book of First Samuel is the phrase. And uh, I thought about this. Jesus himself uh, said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Praise God today that God has a word for us. That uh, uh, you were talking about seemingly insignificant and small people uh, that uh, uh, that uh, God used. God used Mary. God used uh, uh, he came to those shepherds, those lowly men. And uh, I thought about that th same theme that's carried right on through the New Testament. Praise God. I was nothing. I was low down. I'm still nothing and still low down. And none of us can boast in anything in this flesh but praise God. The Word of God, hallelujah, it proceeds from His mouth. And that's what we have to live by, praise God. That is our bread day by day. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, hallelujah. First Samuel 2, 6, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. That word he 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 bringeth indicates wherever one goes, the Lord's already there. Uh, the Lord bringeth. I, I thought about that. Uh, the Lord bringeth. Uh, if I uh, uh, he he's already there. If he's bringing it to him, Amen. What I'm saying is, uh, at, at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus brought him forth because Jesus was there. He's bring, he bringeth, praise God. He bringeth down to the grave. He is there. Uh, he's the God over the grave and he's God over life. And he bringeth up, praise God. He bringeth up to where he's at. And one of these days we shall see him. I simply broke this chapter down. Like this. Verse 1 through 3, there's a want for the Word of God. Oh, can I tell you today, young ones, there's a want today for the Word of God. There's people that want the Word of God. Uh, there's people out there starving. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There's a spiritual hunger today across this land and across this world for the true word of God. And also right here at home, a want for the word of God. Uh, those days, the, 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 the word of the Lord was precious. There was no open vision. What caused this want? What caused this want? Verse number one. Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And as I read that verse of Scripture, something that struck me funny. Samuel was a child. Uh, most writers estimate that he was about 12 years old at this writing. And the Bible says that Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. Now, Eli was the priest. Eli was the man of God. Now, you would think that Eli would be the one ministering unto the Lord before Samuel and showing him the way to do it. Amen. 
uh, you would just think that he would be bringing him along. And I'm going to show you how to do this, Samuel, but there was a woman that day for the Word of God. And uh, I believe it was caused by that very reason. Samuel, the child, ministered before the Lord. And remember, our theme is God raising up a messenger. One would think that Eli would have ministered to train Samuel. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. I believe Eli mishandled his office, the office of the priesthood. And that God was not speaking to him. Now that's my, that's my opinion. That, that's what I get out of this. Is uh, that there was no open vision. There was no word from the Lord. And the, the Eli was the one that you would have thought God would have been speaking to. Him. The word was precious. <coughs> God was not speaking to him. <coughs> and what is precious today? It's the word of God. It is Jesus. The Word of God is what is precious today. Uh, we'll find five times in the book of 1 Peter that he talks about that word precious, 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 precious. 1 Peter 2, 7 says, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. And he's simply talking about Jesus. Uh, and that is what should be precious to us today. The Word, Jesus Christ, should be precious. Amen. The child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. The Word of the Lord was precious. In those days there was no open vision. Amos 8, 11 tells us, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will see famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I would dare say today that we are in that state of mind almost around the country. Amen. People have settled and they've compromised and they've watered down the word of God. And uh, It would surprise you what goes on in a lot of churches outside of western North Carolina. Uh, they have no concept of uh, how to truly serve the Lord. And there is a famine in the land. I'm going to say something this morning, and I'm not politicking, but under God, uh, the world uh, is, uh, is in a mess. Uh, there's a, uh, listen, a war going on, and, and I've not one time, you may have had, but I've not one time heard a politician or, or a news media person say we need to pray. Pray for Ukraine. Pray for what's going on. In times past, I remember when the president would get up and said, call a national day of prayer. They'd ask people to pray. But I've not one time heard them mention, they won't mention God's name. It burns me up. They won't mention Jesus' name. Uh, they'll run around at Christmas time and say, happy holidays. And uh, uh, that, I don't like it, amen? I, I like to keep Jesus in things. Not only at Christmas, but praise God every day of the year. And he said, I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. God speaks his word in his time through his messenger. Amen. God's raising up a messenger and saying, and uh, I'm afraid that across the world uh, there are no messengers. There are messengers. Uh, but they're sending out the wrong message, amen? They are. They're sending out the wrong one, praise God. Now, uh, verse number 11. Uh, I'm going to skip over here and read this. And the Lord said to Samuel, well, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at both which, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth shall tingle. Uh, that, uh, that word tingle, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's it in, it's Saul Alel. That's how it's said in the Hebrew. Give the idea of a vibration to tinkle, rattle together as the ears reddening in shame or the teeth chattering with fear to quiver or to tinkle. 
This is the message that's fixing to come through this child. Fixing to come through Samuel. And also, uh, we'll notice in verse number one, he says the phrase, the child. The child of Samuel. And, and I want to say this. God can use anyone who is willing and obedient. God can use anyone who's willing and obedient. God can use a child. God can use a grown-up that's willing and obedient. I thought about Samuel. Childlike faith is what he had. Uh, he was, uh, who's more humble and trusting than a child? Amen. And here he is raising up Samuel. Samuel, I believe he's humble and he's trusting. He's not got hard-hearted and not got away from the Lord as a lot of folks do when they get up in life and have hard times. Who's more humble and trusting than a child? To have childlike faith. Jesus himself said, be of the little children to come unto me. The purpose of chapter number three, I believe is found in chapter number two. The key verse, verse number 18. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded, you know, in an ephod. Verse number 30 of chapter number two, for them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. In verse number 35, I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. That's what God wants his messenger to do. To say what God would say. Amen. What's on his heart and in his mind. And that's what Samuel uh, that's what he was raised up to do. Verse number two, and it came to pass at that time, when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim, then he could not see. I believe that Eli lost his vision. And I believe he did it in a twofold way. I believe Eli lost his vision physically. Now, I believe he was getting old and I, that, he, that he couldn't see. Uh, I went to the VA doctor this week through eye appointments to get me some new glasses because uh, my, my eyesight's just getting worse and worse. And, uh, that's just the way it is, I guess, as we get older. But uh, uh, Eli, he was, he was getting old, older, and physically I believe that he uh, was losing his eyesight. Uh, but I believe that he uh, spiritually had lost his sight as well. Proverbs 29, 18 tells us where there is no vision, the people perish. That vision must come through the messenger. That messenger must relay that vision unto the folks. And Eli, I believe, had lost his vision. And the people were perishing here. The Bible makes that clear. Uh, the word of the Lord was precious, and there was no open vision. Uh, and Eli, no doubt, was in a spiritual famine in his life. And he was cut off from the Word of God. What a terrible place to be. What a terrible place to be. Uh, do you realize that, that uh, you can be saved by the grace of God and get yourself in such a fix uh, that uh, God won't use you anymore? I remember the story. Uh, years ago, uh, an old preacher, an old evangelist that used to come by the church, his name was Billy Kelly, and uh, he, was a, he was a preacher from way back, and he told the story of uh, this old-time preacher. Uh, the man was an Irishman, and uh, he was just a, a, an on-fire preacher. And, uh, but, but this man... Uh, the devil throw a temptation at him. And that man fell into that temptation. And uh, Brother Lonnie, I believe that, uh, that, that a preacher can disqualify himself from preaching the word uh, biblically by some of the things that uh, that, that man fell into a sin and uh, disqualified himself. Uh, but, but here's the thing. Uh, that man couldn't preach anymore 
But the gifts and calling of God are without remission. Mm -hmm. And uh, if God's called you to do a work, you'll never lose the desire to do that. And, but that man, uh, he, he couldn't take it. He couldn't take my prison. It drove him crazy. They, they put that poor, poor fella in an asylum. And he lived the rest of his years in the asylum. They just they thought he was crazy. But one day he said that old that old Irishman, he called through the door where they had to slide his stuff in and out of his little room. And he called for an attendant. And he said, I want you to bring me my Bible. And uh, they went and got him his old Bible and slid it into him. And uh, those folks that worked there said that that man opened that Bible and preached for about the space of two hours. Oh, no. A message like you had never heard in your life. And then it just went silent. When they went to check on him, he was dead. That was the last thing he'd done on this earth. And uh, uh, I think that's a, sh a, a crying shame that the, the devil would get us in a, a position like that. And we're all vulnerable to it. But I believe, to say what I'm trying to say, is I believe Eli had probably got himself in to a fix. There was a spiritual famine in his life. And he was cut off. Verse number 3, the Bible says, And air the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. Where the ark of God was in Samuel, I was laid down to sleep. Oh, praise God. Yours were the Lord rubbed my cup over this week. When I was studying in this page and just went, Eli might have lost his vision. But God was about to give sight to one who had never saw before. And that was a little boy named Eli. Praise God, God is going to raise him up a message. Church, I would encourage you all. Uh, God forbid that I ever fall off the wagon. But if I did, God can have you another man standing right here next week preaching you the good word of God or, or next month or next year. That's the kind of God that we serve. Amen. And uh, God, oh, uh, the Eli might have lost his vision, but God was about to give sight to one who had never saw before. And that was a little boy named Eli. That was a little boy named Samuel. Uh, going to take the place of Eli. Now, God spoke to Samuel. I want you to notice a word here in your Bible. And, and I've read this scripture my whole life. And, and I've even uh, uh, prepared messages for this scripture. And uh, I've read this, and ere the lamp of God went out. And I just took for granted that the lamp of the Lord went out in the temple. But it didn't. That was the word air. E-R-E. -E. Uh, as I got to studying this, the Lord showed me something. And that I had to rearrange. I want to say this. God will always have a light of witness in this dark world to keep the light shining. And air, the Bible said. That little word air, E-R-E, -E, means not yet. It means before something happens. Praise God, God was raising him up a messenger to send that light out uh, before, uh, to send his message out before that light went out in that temple. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple, God was raising him up a man. He was raising him up a messenger, praise God, that was going to proclaim and keep the light shining in the house of God. He makes this statement, the Lamb of God, and air the Lamb of God. I thought about this as I wrote this verse down. God just give me this. I'm going to give it to you. The Lamb of God. What a picture. What a picture of a Redeemer is the Lamb of God. What that Lamb did. I, I hope one day uh, to, 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 uh, uh, that we can do a study here. If the Lord will allow me to do that on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night through a series of messages about the tabernacle and the things in the tabernacle and what they pertain to and uh, how that everything pointed toward Christ. 
But here is the lamp of God. The lamp of God in the temple. Now, I want to tell you something. There was no uh, outside light came into the temple. The temple was lit by the lamps, the lampstand, uh, with, with, the, with, with three on one side and three on the other. And they lit it with pure olive oil, which is a type of the Holy Spirit. And it lit that room. It lit the temple. And it was the lamp of God. It, it gave light unto the temple. What a picture of the Redeemer. I'm going to read you some scripture, some companion scripture to this. In Exodus chapter 27 and verse number 20, listen to what the Bible says. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee a pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. Praise God, there's always going to be that light burning. Here in the note of my Bible, I use the old Schofield. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Christ is the oil fed light, ever burns, the light of the world. But here we have not the world, but the sanctuary. It was in the temple. It's a question, not of testimony to the world, but of our communion and worship as believer praise. I praise God that what a significance uh, that this lamp had burning out there in the temple. And what a picture, listen, of the Redeemer. The tabernacle, there were two compartments, two lights, the holy place of the candlestick. Listen to this. I want you to get this. Exodus 25, 31. And thou shalt make unto it a Make sure I'm in the right place here. Exodus 25, 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work, shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knots, and his flowers shall be of the same. That candlestick is a type of Christ their light, shining in the fullness of power of the sevenfold spirit. Natural light was excluded from the tabernacle. That's why you had that, that, that light. Praise God in the holy place. And then in the holies of holies, the Shekinah glory of God was manifest. It's important to see that these are still two lights. Christ, the light of life. Through the Spirit, gives light uh, upon holy things of the showbread, the altar, and the incense, and the Shekinah glory on the face of Jesus. In this twofold light, we as believer priests are brought. We walk in the light, not merely which he gives, but in which he lives. And praise God, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. Praise God, what a picture of the Redeemer that we have here in this passage of Scripture, the Lamb of God, at which he would not let go out. And he also said, the temple of the Lord. What a place of redemption. It's where the people came to sacrifice, to rid themselves of sin guilt. Worship and praise the Lord. Oh, praise God. The temple of the Lord. Now, what a place of redemption. It's, it's our place of redemption. Amen. You remember the day when you came in to the temple of God, to the church, and uh, got saved by the grace of God. Hallelujah. What a place of redemption. Where the ark of God was. What a place of reconciliation. Once a year on Yom Kippur, uh, the day of atonement, the Jews' most holy day of the year, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies to burn incense and sprinkle the sacrificial blood. By this act, the high priest atoned for his own sins and the sin of his people. He was simply showing forth. Uh, listen, it was a time. He was showing forth of a brighter day to come. 
Praise God, if when Jesus would come, amen, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, that emblem of suffering and shame. Praise God. And listen, I thought about, I, I thought about what a place of reconciliation. And, and we have to think about Jesus Christ when we think about reconciliation because he bridged the gap between God and man when he hung on the cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And blood ran down that cross. And when the Creator's life's blood touched the creation of this earth, the rocks rent, the earth shook, the veil in the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And Jesus Christ bridged that gap. What a, what a picture. Praise God. Where the ark of God was. What a picture of reconciliation. Oh, and I love this part. I love this part here in this verse. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. That, well, you can read right over that and not get nothing out of it, but what a significance. Oh, this verse just gets better. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. Where was he at? He was in the temple of God. <laughs> he was in a place. That word Shiloh, where that was at, that word means a place of rest. He was in the house of God, outside the heathen rage, the war ravage, and sin rising. But inside Samuel laid himself down to rest. Praise God, I'm glad today that I have a sanctuary. I'm glad that I have a place today to come into. Listen, we get out there in that world and we get tore up and the devil tries to run us down. Amen. He sure does. And he'll do that to every one of us. But praise God, I want to encourage your heart this morning for this place of sanctuary, this place that we can have to come into, to have communion and, and a fellowship and be reconciled with our Savior. Praise God. What a place of rest. Hallelujah. A picture of the Redeemer. A picture of reconciliation. And a place of rest. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm almost there. Let me get through this. I won't be much longer. I hate to stop in here. There's a want for the Word of God in verse 1 through 3, but in verse 4 through 10, there's a way the Lord works. In verse number four, the first time God called Samuel. Samuel heard God but did not recognize his voice. Samuel responded. He did not ignore the voice of God. He responded, but he did not yet know the Lord. And I thought about this a lot of times. I would never discourage a child from coming to the altar. Uh, the, I know that some folks may discourage children and say you're too young, but I would never discourage a child from coming to the altar. Uh, and uh, and may get down there, whoever get down there and pray with them because the Lord may be a calling and they just don't understand it. Amen. Uh, and uh, a lot of times. But uh, he responded. He heard God's voice. Listen. And uh, there's a way that the Lord works. He didn't recognize, but he responded. He went and said uh, to Eli, here am I. Verse number five. Let's notice God is personal. His response. He ran to Eli. Answered, here am I. And uh, in verse number six, the Lord called Samuel. And I want to not say this. The reason I say it's personal is the Lord called him by name. He said, say you know, when the Lord called you to be saved, he calls your name. He said, Lon. He said, Ryan. He said, Elizabeth. He said, Betty. You, you need to be saved. God, he's a personal God. And uh, I'm glad today that he is still my personal God. Amen. Once he saves us. Praise God, I am glad today for that personal Jesus uh, that I have with me. He is personal. I'm glad that he knows my name. I'm glad my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, he, God's not only personal, He's patient. Verse number 7. 
Notice God's patience with Samuel. Uh, there could be folks today, like with child Samuel, that did not yet know the Lord, yet God. Uh, he is patient. Uh, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. God was personal, God was patient. And uh, God's word, his voice, must be spiritually discerned. He did not yet know the Lord. Verse number eight, God is persistent. God did not tell Samuel, hey Samuel, I am God. He allowed Samuel to learn that on his own. Amen. I believe that's what he did. God was persistent. And Samuel, uh, verse number nine, he went and laid down in his place. Samuel was laying in his place, waiting for the Lord. And I want to say something about uh, children that aren't saved. Keep them in the house of God. Keep them in shadow. Keep them in the place of rest. And uh, uh, keep them waiting for the Lord. And one day, one day God will save them. And God is precise in verse number 10. Notice the Lord. Notice what he did. Verse number 10. And the Lord came. He came to where Samuel was at. He stood and he called. Now, I want to say something right here. Uh, I want you to notice that he calls Samuel's name. He called his name twice. He said, Samuel, Samuel. Uh, in numerology, uh, two represents union, such as marriage. Two become one. And this is how God is raising up his messenger. Samuel, Samuel. There's going to be a union. The word, the word, the number two is also represents division. He's going to send a message, and that message is going to be a division of Eli. You remember that uh, uh, over in First Kings seventeen ten, the widow of Zarephath, uh, in verse number twelve, said, "I go to gather two sticks, so that me and my son will die." Uh, she's gathering two sticks. There's going to be a division, she thought, between me and my son. We're going to die. And that's what God is bringing into the message we'll see here. But also, uh, the number two is not only union and division. It can be verification. Samuel was about to be verified by God in the eyes of all Israel. We'll see that in verse number 20. Oh, Dan, from even the Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Verified. Oh, and I want to say this. I, I've got to give you this about this verse. I, I thought this was interesting as I was studying this that God called Samuel four times. He called him four different times, if you'll read the text. God called Samuel four times. The number four derives its meaning from creation. For on the fourth day of creation week, God completed uh, this material universe. On this day, he brought into existence the sun, the moon, and the stars, as referenced in Genesis 1, 14 through 19. Their purpose was not only to give life, uh, which was Samuel's purpose, but to divide day from night, which was also Samuel's purpose, was to divide darkness from light. And interestingly, the Hebrew word for seasons there in Genesis 1.14 is uh, mode. Uh, is uh, literally translated appointed times or divine appointment, which in this case, God called his name four times. It was a divine appointment uh, for Samuel. It was his divine appointment with God. And every one, every one of us has a divine appointment with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now let me say this in closing. We'll be done. I went a little long this morning. I'm sorry, but this is what the Lord gave me. Yeah. And I want you to have it. <clears throat> There's a want for the Word of God. There's a way the Lord 
works. Verse 4 through 10. But in verse 11 through 21, there's a witness. And here is the Lord's sure witness. Let's notice if we get it back early. The Lord's sure witness. Verse 11 through 14. The Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, in which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against thee like all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will make an end, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be for sacrifice or uh, with sacrifice uh, or uh, nor often forever. The Lord's sure word. The word of the Lord, that phrase. Uh, listen, the first mention of it, we've already said, is in Genesis 15 1. And uh, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, I have thy shield and thy buckler. We've already covered that, the law first mentioned, and carries with it that theme. So as with Abraham, so was with Samuel. God was a shield. An exceeding great reward to him. Verse number 12, we'll notice a time. A, a time. I, I believe here, listen, uh, in that day I will perform against Eli. There was a time. There was a time to be born, a time to die, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. A time for every purpose under heaven. And God gave him that time. In chapter number 2, we notice the end of the chapter. If we read it, we'd, we'd see that man of God coming. And he told Eli, God's going to judge your house. There's a time. Verse number 13, there's the terms. I have told him, God never sends judgment before a warning. Before the flood, God sent Noah. Uh, before Nineveh, God sent Jonah. And before Eli, God sent Samuel to tell him of coming judgment. There's the term. In verse 14, it was terminal. If God says it, it's final. And in that verse, you'll notice God said that shall not, and God said forever. He's cutting his house off. The Lord's sure witness, verse 15 through 21. Verse number 15. The fear of the witness. Samuel waited until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. He was scared to show Eli that vision. He, he was afraid of doing what the Lord told him to do. But God gave him the strength to do that. Samuel, uh, the, the faithfulness of the witness. In verse 16 through 18, Samuel told him all. And then there's Eli's callous response. It's the Lord. Let him do what he wants to. And in verse 19 through 21 is the future witness. Oh, we know this Samuel. Here in verse number 19, Samuel is growing. He's growing in the Lord. Every day he's getting more mature spiritually, physically. The Lord has talked to him. Uh, here Samuel is growing physically and spiritually. Samuel was glowing. The Lord was with him. And Samuel was gracious in all of his duty to speak the word of the Lord. He did not let none of his words fall to the ground. He let none of the Lord's words fall to the ground. He was that faithful witness. Let's stand this morning. That faithful witness. He let none of his words fall to the ground. Verse number 21, the confirmation of the Lord's witness and the continuation of fellowship and revelation between the Lord and Samuel. Here it is. And all Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. The Lord confirmed this witness that he raised up. He confirmed Samuel for all Israel. And there was a continuation of fellowship.
and revelation between God and Sam Houston. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, in that place of rest. And the Lord revealed himself. And I believe here, I simply broke it down like this. The Lord appeared again. He was prevailing. The Lord revealed himself. He was personal by the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is precious today. That is what is precious today. And it is powerful. How precious is the word of the Lord. He appeared again to Samuel, as he will you and I. The Lord revealed himself in a personal way, in that place of rest, by the word of God. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the day. Thank you for the blessings of life. Lord, I know it's been scattered today, but God, I thank you for having us. Lord, I pray that you take your message, bless it today. Use it for your honor and your glory, and I know you will, Lord. God, I pray that you dismiss us in your power and in your fear and what you do for us, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, hope you've enjoyed the message today. And uh, if all hearts and minds are clear, you're at liberty to go. And uh, remember service next Sunday. God bless you and hope you have a great one.